worship. It's good to uh, be back in the, the Northeast and with you guys and ready to worship the Lord together. Right? Amen? Amen. Let's praise God. So let's, uh, we're going to worship the Lord. If it's your first time here, welcome to Calvary. Simple stuff here. We just seek the Lord and worship. We're going to take communion tonight. If you didn't get one of these, you'll have an opportunity to grab one, and uh, we're going to study God's Word together. So let's open it in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this evening and for your presence. God, thank you that uh, your word says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, and there is liberty, and there is joy. And Lord Jesus, uh, even tonight in Exodus, Lord, we're going to study about the first song in the Bible. After you delivered the children of Israel through the Red Sea, they will sing out, I will sing unto the Lord. For he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and its rider he's thrown into the sea. And as the psalmist says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And Lord, tonight I pray that we, would, that we wouldn't sing about you, but we would sing to you, Lord. That we would bless you with this worship, that you would be glorified, and that, Father, we would just find ourselves, Lord, individually and collectively Lord, gathered around the throne of grace, worshiping our King Jesus, Lord. So, Father, bless this time, we pray, and it's in Jesus' name. Yes, let's worship. Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won For you have never failed me yet Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Faithfulness I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail me yet. I know the night won't last. Your word will come to pass. My heart will sing your praise again. Jesus, you're still enough. Keep me within your love. My heart will sing your praise again. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. Never fail me yet. I've seen you move, you move the mountains, and I believe I'll see you do it again. You made a way. When there was no way, and I believe, I'll see you do it again. I've seen you move, you move the mountains, and I believe, 
I'll see you do it again. You made a way when there was no way. And I believe I'll see you do it again. I'll see you do it again. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never failed me. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never failed me yet. You never failed me yet. Thank you, Jesus, that we can just go to you, God, and we can talk to you, Jesus. I just pray that as we sing this next song, let's just prepare our hearts just to cry out to God and um, just to talk to him, just to ask him to revive our nation, our country. And I pray that um, we would just have hearts that are just wanting to hear from God. And um, let's just start this revival here in our circle with us. A revival starts with us when we meet with God and we get to know him. done before in greater measure you will do again cause there's no prison wall you can't break through no mountain you can't move all things are possible and there's no broken body you can't raise, no soul that you can't save, all things are possible. The darkest night, you can light it up, you can light it up, oh God of revival, let hope arise. Death is overcome, you've already won, oh God of revival, you rose in victory, and now you're seated forever on the So why should my heart fear what you've defeated? I will trust in you alone. Cause there's no prison wall you can't break through. No mountain you can't move. All things are possible. No, there's no broken body you can't raise, no soul that you can't save, all things are possible, the darkest night, you can light it up, you can light it up, oh God of revival, let hope arise. Death is overcome, you've already won, oh God of revival, oh God of revival. Come awaken your people. 
people. Come awaken your people. Come awaken your city. Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Every stronghold will crumble. Hear the chains hit the ground. Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Come awaken your people. Come awaken your city. Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Every stronghold will crumble. Hear the chains hit the ground. Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. The darkest night, you can light it up, you can light it up. Oh God of revival, let hope arise, death is overcome. darkest night, you can light it up, you can light it up, oh God of revival, let hope arise, death is overcome, you've already won, oh God of revival. Come awaken your people. Let's sing this together. Come awaken your people. Come awaken your city. Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Every stronghold will crumble. Hear the chains hit the ground. Oh, God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, tonight we do, we pray that, we cry that out. Lord, we just want to see your kingdom come, your will be done. God, we just acknowledge, Lord Jesus, that, uh, Lord, we're in trouble. God, we just acknowledge it. We Lord, we just acknowledge, Lord, our, our, our hearts, Lord, even as believers here tonight, Father, are far from you, God. We just acknowledge it, Lord. We acknowledge, Lord, what your word says, that you have given us a matter-of-fact promise in your word. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then they will... I will forgive their sin, they'll hear from heaven, and I will heal their land. And God, we just ask you, Lord, by your sovereignty, by your Holy Spirit, Lord, to uh, do what you need to do to get us to that place, Lord. We acknowledge tonight we're not there, that we as believers in Jesus in this nation are not in a Second Chronicles 714 posture, Lord. And we ask you, Holy Spirit, to Bring us to that place, Lord. Father, we ask you to forgive us for telling you what to do. And Lord, we ask you what to do, Lord. What would you have us to do, Lord? What would you have us to do in these days that we are living in, these dark days? These days, Lord, where the birth pangs are so severe and we're, we're not seeing them, Lord. God, what would you have us to do? Lord, please, by your spirit, move upon us. We ask you. Awaken us, Lord. And as was prayed tonight, we pray, Lord, God, rather than us praying, Lord, for all the churches around us, rather than us praying for Washington, God, we ask you, Lord, to change us here tonight. Change us, Lord. God, we are not the, the, the righteous ones, the ones that have figured it out and everybody else is wrong. Lord, it's us. Start in, in us, Lord. Start in me, Lord. Please, God, tonight we pray. and 
We just thank you for your grace, Lord. We thank you that you are slow to anger, that you abound in love. And tonight, God, we do ask you to just meet us here at this table. Lord, at the communion table. Lord, meet us here. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You can go ahead and be seated. If you need a communion element, you can slip up your hand and we'll get that to you. We're going to come to the table. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because, uh, you know, Jesus tells us in, uh, well, well, actually Paul, but it's the Holy Spirit there in 1 Corinthians, that whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he returns. You know, and that's, that's the job, right? Sometimes as Christians, we forget what the job is. We think, oh, this is the job or that's the job. I'm supposed to be doing this or doing that. But really, the job, like Paul said, you know, I figured it out, man. I'm going to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified, right? I'm, I'm going to use my breath to point people to Jesus. And it's because this is the place where God reconciled sinful man to himself, you and I. So tonight, if you have the bread, let's take that out. Lord, we are so grateful for this, this uh, bread, Lord, this, this cracker that reminds us, that brings us back in our mind's eye to Golgotha, to the cross, Jesus, where you died. Brings us back to remind us of the nails in your wrists and your feet. And it brings us back to the place where we're reminded that we put you there. Lord, we may have not physically been there 2,000 years ago. But Lord, tonight we remember it was our sins, Lord. It was our sin that nailed you to that tree, nailed you to that cross. And tonight, Lord, we just thank you. Thank you for your sacrifice for us. Thank you, Lord, that we get to be your sons and daughters. Thank you, Lord, that we're reminded tonight we did not earn this this Christian thing. We did not earn for our names to be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But, Lord Jesus, you died for us. You are the sacrifice for our sins. And tonight we remembered that. Lord, we pray as we eat that we would just humble ourselves, that we would be in a posture of you are God, we are not, and that Lord, we would grow from this. So, Father, we thank you tonight for your broken body, and together we eat in remembrance of you. Thank you, Jesus. Let's partake. And Lord, tonight we do also thank you for this cup. And Lord, we just remember the blood of your suffering. Lord, we remember your blood that washes us white as snow and cleanses us of all our sins. And Lord, tonight we do ask you to just forgive us, Lord. Lord, forgive us. We thank you, your word. It, Lord, the cross of Jesus Christ dealt a death blow to our sin nature. It dealt a death blow to sin in us. But the blood of Jesus, again and again in Scripture, we see it says that it washed our sins away. Lord, our day-to-day, Lord, Lord, uh, sins against you. God, we just thank you that we are washed. We thank you that we don't have to go through this life guilty, dirty, unclean. But as you said to Peter, you said, Pete, unless you let me wash you, You can have no part with me. So tonight we just thank you for the blood of Jesus. I personally want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you for washing me. Thank you tonight that I get to stand before your people. I get to stand here with my brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, cleanse. Not because of my own washing. Not because I went through some religious ceremonial situation. But it's the blood of Jesus. It's better than the blood of goats. The blood of lambs. It washes a man who washes a woman of all sin. So tonight, Lord, we thank you. And Lord, we just, Lord, this is by faith. As we partake, as your word says, as often as you gather together, do this in remembrance of me. This this is a powerful thing. And Lord, we just take in this juice, Lord, and we know it's more than a ritual that you are here among us. Lord Jesus, we pray that your spirit would fill us. There would be a washing and a cleansing. Lord, even tonight, there would be a healing Lord, of pain, of brokenness, of sorrow. Lord, we just uh, thank you. We recognize your presence here. We drink, Lord, in remembrance of you. Thank you, Jesus. Let's partake. Mm. Thank you, Lord.
Let's sing this together. What can wash away my sins? What is it? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can, what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Good job. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All right. Well, good evening, if you would. Go ahead, stand. Give somebody a handshake, a hug. Tell them good evening. Very good. Calvary. We're glad to have you. I'm Pastor Bill. We love you. Uh, we just want you to have a safe place to come, learn the word, and uh, grow in your walk with the Lord, and I pray that we're doing just that. You know, I just um, uh, got back. Once again, if you need a Bible, some of your hand, we'll get that to you. I had a great Sunday. I know uh, Pastor Robert was here from the bridge. Did you guys get to meet him, Pastor Robert? You know, you hear him on the bridge, uh, Bible question and answers. You know, I've been on that question and answer thing. I told them, don't ever make me go on this thing again, you know. Don't ever make it. You know, they have, uh, I don't know if you know this, I'm about to tell the secrets. You want to know the secrets? So when you're there, all the questions come in in advance, so you can kind of research them. And then as the pastor, you get to pick which questions you want to answer. So when I'm up there, I'm like, no, nah, I don't want to answer that one. Nope, not that one. Nope, that one. You know, they find, like, I just skip all of them. Like, the whole thing I skip until it's, like, some real basic question. Like, how do you become a Christian? Okay, okay I'll do that one. I'll, I'll do that one. You know? so, like, people will call in. They'll be like, is the Illuminati in the Bible, and how does it relate to the seven trumpet judgment? I'm like, I don't know. You know, is that okay if I say that when you answer? You know? So, uh, you know, I think they figured out, don't have me back on there, you know. One guy asked a question. I said, you don't want to know the answer to that because you don't even know Jesus. You know, they were like, you can't say that. I was like, I just did, didn't I? You know, I was like, you know, one guy was like, how many girls can I date according to the Bible? I was like, listen, I don't care what church you go to. You're, something's wrong with you. You know what I mean? So it was, it was interesting. But Pastor Robert, great, much nicer than me. So I'm sure you guys had a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful Sunday. But uh, I was out actually at a men's uh, Calvary conference in Oregon speaking to them. The reason, uh, you know, I tried this. I, actually, I, I got ahead of myself singing the Blood of Jesus song. And I realized I, I literally shared, I think it was five or six messages over the course of like three days. So my voice is a little raspy. But uh, I'll be fine. Don't worry about it. I'll be have a good night. But um, just a wonderful time with with uh, brothers uh, and men out in out in Oregon and in that region of the country. And uh, you know, I brought the greetings of the gospel over there, and I bring them back uh, to us from them there. They're living for Jesus out there. Definitely a crazy place, though. I'm not going to lie to you. You know, uh, definitely a very interesting place to be. And but the gospel is going forth there. Um, you know, Jesus is moving. The word of God is being preached, and it's exciting, so I, I want you to be uh, encouraged, encouraged by that. Uh, tonight, we're going to be in the book of Exodus, so if you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and open those up. We're uh, making our way right through the book of Exodus, as always here, uh, chapter by chapter, book by book, and we're in Exodus 15 tonight. Um, tonight, if you're taking note, the title to the message is, Worship, Worship, Praise and Worship is Our Warship. <laughs> Worship is our worship. I actually studied for this on the plane ride back. Uh, the person, the, the man, woman next to me was very interesting. I said, you're not here by accident, are you? You know, uh, she was looking at a lot of this stuff. But, uh, you know, I, I wrote that down. Worship. Worshiping the Lord. It's our worship. You know, it's, it's very powerful. 
know, it's powerful in our own walk with the Lord as followers of Christ to worship God, but it's also powerful in the realm around us, this spiritual realm that we live in. You know, um, it's very powerful when, when, when redeemed believers in Jesus, as the psalmist said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. What that means is when redeemed believers in Jesus sing out a song to the Lord, it's very powerful. It cha- Just like the thermostats change the temperature in the room, worship to Jesus changes the temperature in a region. Very powerful, the worship of the Lord. And we're going to see that tonight, and we're going to see some principles of worship. We're going to see how to worship a little bit, and we're going to learn it from this first song. This is Exodus 15. This is the first song in the Bible. First song in the Bible, interestingly enough, we'll see it tonight. It's also similar to the last song in the Bible. So, Father, tonight, as we have your word open, God, as we're going to talk about worship, something that for a million years from now, we're not going to be watching any more TV. God, we're not going to um, go to the beach anymore. I know some are very disappointed about that. Lord, we're not going to uh, do a lot of these things. But, Lord, we're going to be worshiping you still. And, God, we pray tonight as followers of Christ that we would grow in this. I pray that there would be a awakening, Lord, even these days we're in to what's happening and what's happening around us and how worship plays a part in that. And Lord, we ask you to bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, uh, go away and, you know, I'm in the other side of the country and, uh, you know, first thing that happens is we've got a uh, earthquake, right? Earthquake in New York. Who would have guessed, you know? But they're, they're, you know, I'm, I'm there at the conference and somebody says, oh, pastor, do you hear you had an earthquake in New York? I'm going, oh, no, you know? I'm on the other side of this country. It's a big country we live in. And I just thought, wow. You know, and then, then on my way back, we've got this solar eclipse. You know, and people have got the light the thing is on. You know, some of you guys, I heard, traveled quite far to see the sun blocked out by the moon. God bless you, you know. It's very interesting. But, you know, if you're not paying attention here, you're not catching this. You know, what we are watching in the days we're living in is, is the birth pangs of the imminent return of Jesus Christ. It's what's happening, guys. This is what's happening. Uh, the wars, the rumors of wars, the tribalism, right? The, the, the attempt of society and the world, the flesh, and the devil to divide us based on the least defining attribute of us, which is our skin color. Uh, you know, all of this, the corruption, the, the, the direction towards a one-world government, a one-world currency, a one-world, you know, religion, religious system, right? We're watching you know, we're watching the most unsuspecting people call themselves Christian, and you're going, uh, I don't think you're a Christian, you know, not according to any biblical standard, right? We're watching this play out in front of us. We're having the earthquakes. We're having all of this craziness. You know, and tonight, you know, what are we to do in response to this? You know, how do we respond to these days we're living in? What, what is our part as believers in Jesus Right? As we're following the Lord and God is calling us to himself and saying, follow me, what is our response going to be? You know, Tonight we're going to see Exodus 15. We're going to see the children of Israel's response to a cataclysmic event. Right, I would say the parting of the Red Sea <laughs> and they're walking through on dry land and the entire Egyptian army in one second being swallowed up is, a, is quite an event. And you'll see tonight, for you note takers, jot it down, this is, their response is that of worship. It's to praise the Lord. It's to sing out. Listen, uh, before I was a follower of Jesus, you know, the only songs I sang were ones I would never sing again. You know, the music I listened to was very different. And I remember coming to Christ, getting born again, and coming to church. And man, you know, to be honest, I I love the messages. You know, I love the messages. My brain was still being refashioned and reformed. And, you know, I was trying to get it to work again, you know. But but worship was something I just kind of didn't get. I'll never forget kind of being at church and watching people lift up their hands. And I, you know, for me, I would just kind of look at them like, what in the world are they doing right now? Like, what is this? What is this? You know, I came from a sports background. I'm like, somebody made a field goal somewhere in the world. You know, I remember, you know, I remember asking this, this older guy, I said, what is that about? They go, well, the Bible says you lift up holy hands to the Lord. And I said, but still, I mean, for that long, I mean, I don't even know if I have the shoulder muscles to do that, you know? 
I said, boy, I hope they all wore, wore deodorant. You know, that's what I was thinking. And I remember one guy said to me, he says, you know what it is, Bill? You know, like a, a, a kid, when their father comes home, how they lift their hands, they say, pick me up, Dad. So that's, that's what it is. I said, oh, I like that. I like that. I still didn't lift my hands. You know, that was weird, you know. I remember the first time in my Christian experience, my Christian walk, where I lifted my hands in worship. I'll tell you, I must have shared the gospel with a thousand people before I got up the guts to lift up my hands in church. You know, I was like, I'm going to do it today. Today's the day. Today's the day. I remember going, I'm going to do it. It's going to happen. I remember it's like halfway. Through. I don't even know what the songs were. If they were singing Bob Marley songs, I wouldn't have known. You know, I wouldn't know. Because I was just like, fine. I was like, ah, ah. You know, then you kind of do it. You do it. And you're like, okay, that's it. That's enough worship for today, you know. And uh, I don't know why I told you that, but I just did, you know. You know, it's worship. You know, it's supposed to be a little uncomfortable. It's supposed to be a little outside of yourself. It's supposed to push you a little farther than you're, you're used to, you know. Uh, I can recall, you know, uh, in worship, folks, it's not just about worshiping God. It's not like only people in church worship things, right? I mean, if you recall before you were a believer, you know, spending all night worshiping all these other gods, right? Worshiping Bacchus, the god of alcohol. Worshiping, you know, Aphrodite, sexual type things. You worship, and then at the end of it, you really worship. You're in a posture of prayer. Remember, you were on your knees worshiping at the bowl. It's the truth. It's worship, man. It's worship. Maybe it's not worship of the, the Aphrodite or of the Bacchus, but maybe it's worship of Baal. You go, nobody worships Baal today, right? Prosperity. My gosh, I mean, people will work themselves to death to get that next position at work. Work themselves to death just to get that that commendation or that raise or that new title, right? They'll do whatever it takes, step on whoever is necessary to get to that next place. It's worship, right? It's worship. It's energy. There's all these ways to worship. I mean, if you and I are to get in the car and go to one of these, uh, you know, one of these Yankee games or, you know, I don't know if you'd want to go to a Met game. It's kind of worse wor the time, but, you know, go to a Yankee game. You know, you go to one of these things, the Jets, the Giants, you go to, you know, the Knicks game. They're going to the playoffs, it looks like. Praise the Lord, right? But you go, I mean, you're going to see worship there, guys. You're going to see it. We don't call it worship. But, I mean, you're going to see if you go to a Yankee game, there's armies of people in the right field stands that shout out the name of every player. And they don't stop until they wave their hat, right? They call them the bleacher worship creature. That's what they call them. I've been in there before. I mean, that is some serious worship, <laughs> you know. They're like, oh, you mean these guys to lift up a joyful noise. My gosh. I mean, some of it's joyful. Some of it's not so joyful. But, I mean, they are saying blessings and cursings in that place, right? It's worship. That's what it is. It's worship. Maybe you don't know it. Maybe you didn't realize it. You know, the guy who's out there. I mean, some folks, it's like, how many times can you clean your car? It's like, dude, the thing is so clean. It changed the color. It's a different color. That's worship. I'm telling you, it's worship. And the key to life, man, it's finding the right one to worship. And here in Exodus, we're seeing that Moses and the children of Israel are learning, I think we found him. I think it's the God of the Bible. And that's where we pick it up. Exodus 15. Remember, God had just decimated the Egyptian army. They have been swallowed up in the Red Sea. Their bodies now are washing up, and we're going to pick it up, Exodus 14. We're just going to back up a few verses to verse 30. So the Lord saved Israel, Exodus 14, verse 30, that day out of the hand of the Egyptian, and Israel, the nation, saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. So as this song is being played, as the worship is happening, there are chariots, and there are horses, and there are horsemen and soldiers washing up. In the midst of this worship, listen, worship is our worship, guys. Verse 31, thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. We pick it up, Exodus 15, verse 1. Then Moses and the children of Israel, they sang this song. And I want you to know things here to the Lord. So this is the first time in the Bible we see uh, worship, right? We see the singing of a song. And we also see it is directed to the Lord. This is not a song about the Lord. 
You know, this is different than, you know, kumbaya. This isn't a song about God. This isn't Christian radio necessarily, a song about God. And there's nothing wrong with that for learning or entertainment purposes. But worship is not about entertainment. Worship is a song to the Lord. We're singing to him. He's listening. The Bible says he is enthroned in the praises of his people. He's here in the midst of us. And they sang this song to the Lord and spoke saying, I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. Verse two, the Lord is my strength and he is my song and he has become my salvation. He is my God and I will praise him. My father's God, note this, he says, and I will exalt him. It means to, I will lift him up above all others. Listen, tonight, if you're taking note, number one is we're going to learn the songs and sing. You know, throughout the Bible, when it comes to worship, we see we have to learn these songs and then we have to sing them. We have to sing them. There's something about opening our mouths in worship. You know, when you do that, you should be doing that here at church. You should be doing that on your car rides home. Guys, you could do it in your house. When you go to open your Bible in the morning to spend some time with the Lord, I'd encourage you right there, sing a song to the Lord. You know, one of the most beautiful things about the Lord is it doesn't matter what your voice sounds like. But God's not like, oh man, you know, I, I wish he would sing to me a little less. It's got a, oh, I said a joyful noise unto the Lord. You know, it sounds like you shot some animal or something there. You know, God's not like that. God loves it. He loves it. You know, you know, when you're, it's your birthday or something and your kids are singing you happy birthday, if one of them, you know, you know, can't find, can't find it, you're not like, man, could you just stop? Let the rest of them sing. Like, you don't do that. You know, God hears this. It blesses him. It's worship, guys. This is that first song, you know. Uh, in the first song in the scriptures, it's interesting because the last song in the scripture is also a song of Moses. You know, if you keep your finger there, you turn all the way to the back of the Bible, to the book of Revelation. I'll read it to you. Revelation 15, verse 3 through 4. Now, I want to tell you something here. You're going to want to learn this song. Why? Well, we're going to sing this song in heaven. So if you're here, you're a child of God, you're forgiven, you're following Jesus, you're going to heaven. And we're going to sing this song. And in heaven, they don't have any, any screens, guys. I don't know if you know that. There's no screens in heaven. So you're going to have to learn the song. That's why it's here. And, uh, you know, I don't want, you know, Moses or David coming over and be like, hey, Bill, some of your people don't know the song. What were you doing? You know, I don't want that. So I want you guys to learn this thing. And it's, it's Revelation 15. It says, verse 3, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all nations shall come and worship before you. For your judgments have been manifested. You know, they worship him for what he's done, but they worship him also for his grace, but they worship him also for his judgments. When we get to heaven, we're going to worship God for all of these things. And back to Exodus 15. We see this, the first song, it's a Moses, the last song of Moses, and you know why that is? I don't know, I don't know. You know. I did a lot of reading on it, and I still can't put it together, but God knows. When we get to heaven, we'll go, that's why the first song is of Moses and the last of Moses. It is what it is. Worship is one of those things that's a little different than, than our analytical thinking. You know, we don't really fully understand. I don't understand why when I lift up my song to the Lord, it blesses him. I don't know why it does, but I know it does. And worship is like that, guys. Worship is one of those things. And we will stand on the other side of this shore. We will be in the kingdom of heaven. And we're going to worship the Lord together. Right, amen? We're going to sing praises to him. Uh, as I often say here, it's not going to be hallelujah you. It's not going to be hallelujah me. It's going to be hallelujah what? Hallelujah. Praise to God. He's going to get all the glory, and that's what Moses shows us here. Let's continue verse 3, and we're going to read all the way to verse 19. The Lord, this is a song now, is a man of war. So Moses is leading them. There's no inclination here that they've learned this song in advance. So Moses is kind of like leading them. I could just imagine, is it just me or just, I don't, I'm not going, I don't think Moses has, you know, you know, Pavarotti's voice. You know, I'm considering, you know, I'm thinking, 
the Lord is a man of war. That's how I read it. I do not. I don't think we're getting to heaven and Moses is going to be, you know, Chris Tomlin. I don't think so. I don't, I don't see it that way. But he says, but he's leading them in worship. That's what worship is. It's, it's us together. You know, it's us. We're worshiping the Lord. God wants to hear us sing. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. And they never learned this song. And somehow they, they're led in a way to, lead, to, to follow along. It's important. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has cast into the sea. This is all a song, guys. His chosen captains also are drowned in the sea, the Red Sea. Now, I want you to underline that, note that, because some skeptics, you know, if you wonder, you know, if you're paying attention to the world and you're like, that person says they're a Christian, I don't think so. You see, what's happened is, uh, you know, people have gone to the Bible and they've explained everything away. You know, they're, they, and you got to be careful with this. We talked about this at, uh, at Resurrection Sunday on Easter. You know, many, many, many will say, well, you know, Jesus didn't rise from the dead. You know, the, the most popular theory, it's called the swoon theory. It's not even close. And there's been books written on this. They teach this in universities. They say, listen, the Christians say Jesus won for the dead. What really happened was he was crucified, but he didn't die all the way. He wasn't fully dead. And when they put him in there, the cold air in the tomb revived him. I mean, they say this. They say it in such a way that if you don't believe it, they make you feel like you're stupid. But in order to believe it, you actually have to be stupid. I'm telling you. You got to actually be stupid, right? So, I mean, Jesus was whipped, crown of thorns, right? Beaten, bag over his head, beaten. I mean, this is the crucifixion. This ain't, this is an Xbox at an American jail here, folks, right? This is a little different. You know, then, then he's crucified, hangs there six hours, nails to his wrists and his feet. A Roman soldier puts a spear to his side. The Romans also were experts. Jesus wasn't the only guy crucified that, that, day, that day or that week or that month. I mean, they were notorious for this. They knew when somebody was dead. But then the idea that he was still alive, they put him in a tomb. What is it? Two-ton boulder is put in front of him. This guy with no medical attention revives from the cold air, pushes the stone away, defeats the Roman guard there, no, no, no medical attention, guys. I mean, he still has his ribcage showing, right? His blood's been drained. It's ridiculous. Well, it's pretty close to what they say about this. They say, oh, this is a misrepresentation. It wasn't the Red Sea. It was the Reed Sea. It was a small swampland. They crossed through. You know, I still don't understand how the waters of the Reed Sea swallowed up the Egyptian army exactly. But again and again, really here, guys, you know, uh, we see the Red Sea. In the Hebrew, it's Yam Suf, if you want to know. Yam Suf. And do we know exactly where uh, the children of Israel crossed over? Uh, we don't, really. We don't know exactly where. That is, that is true. You know, we don't know exactly where George Washington, you know, crossed the Delaware either. We know he crossed it, though. I, I, th I think. I heard somebody question that recently. But anyways, you know. It's like the flat, uh, the world's flat. It's like, oh boy, here we go. But, it, you know, basically it was uh, the Gulf of Aqaba. It's eight miles across. You know, this is a massive area, a huge body of water. And, uh, you know, again and again, the Bible tells us it's the Red Sea. Uh, similar to the resurrection, if you don't want to believe it, say you don't believe it. But don't make up stories about it. This is what the Bible records, flat out. The Bible doesn't record that God parted a marshland <laughs> and somehow the Egyptian, the greatest fighting army on the planet, got swallowed up in some mud and somehow got swallowed up by the water. I mean, that's not what's happening here. Uh, the Bible records they went through the Red Sea. It was miraculous. Um, and it's important we remember that. Verse 5, the depths have covered them. They sank to the bottom like a stone. <laughs> this is a song. Your right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, has dashed the enemy in pieces. And in the greatness of your excellence, you have overthrown those who rose against you. You sent forth your wrath. It consumed them like stubble. And with the blast of your nostrils, I love that part. With the blast of your nostrils, the waters were gathered together. So thank you. Somebody gave us an illustration here tonight. So Jesus sneezed and he handled it. It's like, how did God, you know... I, I used this on somebody recently. They're like, how did God do that? I said, well, he sneezed, and that was it. You know, that's it. God sneezes, and the oceans part, you know. The blast of his nostril. 
Uh, now, I don't know that Moses was trying to make doctrine here, guys, but it's a song. The waters were gathered together. The flood stood upright like a heap. The depths congealed in the heart of the sea. Verse 9, the enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall be satisfied on them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. This is the Lord. You blew with your wind, Lord. The sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you? Glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders. You stretched out your right hand. The earth swallowed them. You and your mercy have led forth the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them in your strength to your holy habitation. Verse 14, the people will hear and be afraid. Sorrow will take hold of the inhabitants of Philistia. That's interesting. You know, if you have a King James Version, it says Palestina, right? This helps us understand what's happening in our world today. You know, we've, right now we have, you know, if you don't, if you don't see the, the return of Christ as soon, you, you know, you maybe don't know the Bible. That's okay. We could teach you here. But, but, you know, really this conflict between Israel and Palestina or Philistina, this is not a new thing. You know, if you read in your Old Testament about David fighting Goliath, David was what? He was a, he was a Hebrew and Goliath was a Philistine. It's the same. And then obviously even that, that battle was a big battle in Israel's history. You know, Israel will drive out the Philistines. God says this is now going to be their, my, my people's land because of the idolatry in this land and the killing of their children, sacrificing to Molech and Baal there. And God says it's, it's over with. I, I've been patient with you. You haven't repented. I'm going to drive you out of the land. I'm going to give it to the Jews. But then Rome, the Roman Empire comes on the scene, folks. And the Roman Empire, they will destroy the temple of Jerusalem, 70 AD, Titus Vespasian. When he does, he is so angry because remember, the Romans, uh, you know, the Romans had been able to get all the people groups that they would conquer to assimilate to their society and to their government, but the Jews didn't do it. And they were so angry, Titus Vespasian and the powers that be said, we're going to name this land after the Jews' arch enemy, and that was Philistina or Palestine, Palestine. It's, it's where we're at today, folks. You know, there will be no peace in Israel until the Prince of Peace returns. There will be no peace. You know, we're very close. The Bible literally says that in the last days, right before the return of Christ, that Israel would be a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. Whoever tries to move her will be broken themselves. And Jesus will come to her aid. It's pretty amazing what we're getting to watch. But I hope we're, I hope we're watching properly. You know, I was a little taken back. Now, listen, please don't misunderstand me. My own kids went outside with those little funny little Star Trek glasses and looked up, you know, at the little solar eclipse thing. And praise God for that. It's fine. But if, if that's all we're taking away from that, we're missing something. Right? The earthquake wasn't like, whoa, there's an earthquake, man, right? If, we, if that's all we're taking away from it, we're missing the point here. The Lord is shaking the nations, God is trying to get mankind's attention. I mean, we had, uh, you know, back in the 2000s, we had 9-11, right? September 11, 2001. And it shook people and many came to know Christ. Well, in, the, in this last time, right, 2020s, we had this, you know, whatever this thing was exactly, which is an interesting conversation, this global, at least we know, we thought it was something, right? This global shutdown and the coronavirus and all this. But rather than people turning to Jesus, the majority of churches in America actually closed. And rather than people getting saved at record numbers, we actually saw record numbers of people who called themselves Christians stop reading their Bibles. If you're not seeing we're at those times, guys. We're here. We're here. We're in these days. We're, we're you know, if this was one of those sand timers, I mean, I got bad news. I got good news for you, actually. It's good news if you're a child of God. There's only a few grains of sand left in this timer. Like, I don't know how much the Lord, I don't know how much more God could do to say, wake up, wake up. And first he's saying to his church, wake up, man. Let's get back. Let's, let's, let's see this. You know, and I'm praying for this. One last great revival. But we see this here, inhabitants of Philistia, verse 15 then the chiefs of Edom will be dismayed, the mighty men of Moab, trembling will take hold of them. All the inhabitants of Canaan will melt away. 
Fear and dread will fall on them by the greatness of your arm. They will be as still as a stone till your people pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over whom you have purchased. You will bring them in and plant them in the mountains of your inheritance. You know, understand, who is, who is the one who's singing this song right now? Who's singing this? It's Moses. That was, okay, okay. It so wasn't Paul the apostle. That was a good try. It was Moses. No, I'm just kidding. It's Moses. Had Moses ever been to Israel? Did he ever go to Jerusalem? Where did Moses raised? Moses in Egypt, right? Moses never been there. How did he know all of this stuff about Israel? How did he know about the mountain of Israel where Jesus would be crucified, right? In, in Jerusalem. How did he know these things? It's the Lord. It's the Spirit of God. You know, worship is powerful, guys. It's powerful. The Spirit of God is powerful. Worship is powerful uh, in, in our realm, in our region, in the mountain of your inheritance, in the place, O oh Lord, which you have made for your own dwelling. Why did God create Israel? Why did he make Jerusalem? It's for his own dwelling. The sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. Verse 18, the Lord shall reign forever and ever. For the horses of Pharaoh went with his chariots and his horsemen into the sea. And the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them. But the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea. Now listen, worship is our worship. (laughs) Number one was we need to learn the songs and sing. Like learn these songs and sing them to the Lord. You know, learn these songs and worship the Lord. If you're struggling with depression, anxiety, fear, worry, are you worshiping the Lord? Are you singing songs to him? Do that. You can do that. And number two, we need to remember in worship, it's all God's grace, guys. It's all God's grace. I want you to notice in Moses' song, he doesn't talk about how great he was or how great the children of Israel were. You don't see here worship, and and, you know, I do, I do, you know, and and I try to be humble with this and just worship the Lord and not be overly critical of the modern church, but I do struggle with a lot of these, a lot of songs, I do, because a lot of it seems it's like, you know, I did this and I did that, and it's worship, and I'm going, I don't know how many times I should appear in a worship song to Jesus, I just don't know. know. I remember when I was saved. I remember in the church at that time, there was a really popular song. It was called, I found Jesus. Right? I found Jesus. I remember going, who? I didn't find Jesus. Did you find Jesus? I remember, I, I, I was like worshiping. I ran from Jesus. You know? you know, that's all I could think of was I didn't find him. I mean, he didn't really leave me much choice in the matter. He chased me down. You know, I'd play football. I mean, I'd never been tackled so hard in my life other than by Jesus. I just felt convicted lying in worship, you know. You know, and I love the old hymn there. And I'm not trying to diss this song, but I'm about to, so I'm sorry in advance. You know, I surrender all. Have you sang that? You need to repent. <laughs> you know, I couldn't do it. I remember I was first saying, I was like, Lord, I surrender very little, Lord, you know. Like, I mean, let's be honest here. I mean, we surrender all. We live in the United States of America. Maybe they sing that in Africa. You know, what do we surrender? Lord, I'm fasting the 8 p.m. hour of television tonight. You know, 9, I'll flip it back on for your glory. <laughs> Suffering for Jesus. Somebody told me recently, I've been fasting sugar. No, that's called a diet. That's a diet. That's not fasting. You know, it's like, it's just a kind of funny thing, you know. You know, I'm making fun of everyone right now, but it's worship. It's about the Lord. You know, it's like, well, I'm not really feeling the worship today. It's not about what you feel, guys. Worship isn't for us. It's not. We're going to get to heaven, and it's going to be like song 19,462. We're going to say, yeah, how would it worship? I don't really like that song. You know, they're going to be, oh, the Lord's going to go, oh, stop. The guy all the way in the back over there, he's really far because he didn't do many good works. He's all the way back from New York. He don't like this song. Let's switch it up, right? Not going to happen that way, guys, you know. It's not about us. It's an opportunity for a time to not be about us. It's good for us. It's good for us. It's good for us to worship the Lord, to realize, Lord, you are God. I'm not. That's how it's supposed to be. It allows us to realign things to reality. You know, one of the great challenges in the world, one of the reasons 
One of the main reasons psychologically why Satan is able to execute so much of his plan on planet Earth today is he has gotten the majority of human beings to fundamentally, the majority of the time, think about themselves. And once he gets you thinking more about yourself than you do about the Lord or about others, you're basically dead meat. You know, he's got you. Because, you know, it's like, you know, it's like people are like, I'm depressed and I think about myself all the time. I don't understand why. It's literally called, de- you ever think about this? It's literally called depress. It's literally called pressing in on yourself. And you go to the, 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 the person that's supposed to be the expert in this, and they say, have you taken any me time lately? <laughs> I'm like, Let me look at your screen time for a second, and we'll find out. It's like, oh, 47 hours in a 24-hour day focused on only what you want to think about. Yeah, that's some me time, I would say. You know? Now I know you're convicted right now. And you should be. You should be. No, I love you. Me too. But I'm saying worship is an opportunity for to take a breath and to go underwater and to just focus on the Lord. And that's what Moses does here. You know, and he says it's God's grace. It's God's grace. It's who God is. You know, it's re- recognizing the greatness of your God where he says there, you and your mercy have led forth the people when you have, whom you have redeemed. You know, why did God deliver the Israelites out of Egypt, Egyptian bondage, and through the Red Sea? You know, if you want to read it later, Psalm 106, verse 6 through through 48, you know, God will set the children of Israel free from Egypt. And they'll be free. They'll go into their land. But then later on, they'll go into bondage again to the Babylonians. But 70 years. You know, God will give them this psalm there in Psalm It's incredible. And, but you read it, and it's really all about Israel's failings. It's how unfaithful they were and how faithful God was. You know, it's, it's the nevertheless. There's this one part in Psalm 106. I just love it. You know, he says, nevertheless. Like it says, all of Israel's failings, nevertheless, God was merciful. You know, guys, we're the nevertheless. Like we're the nevertheless. It's by God's grace we're not consumed. You know, I remember before I was a Christian, you know, I sinned all the time sin you know i just lived in a sinful culture (laughs) that was my problem it wasn't me it was the culture around me and then i got saved and from that point on i've never sinned again (laughs) it's like where did we get this idea that that's supposed to be the christian testimony i'm going to tell you right now it's not in the bible it's not true it's not in the bible paul the apostle who wrote two-thirds of the new testament as he continued his writing he communicated publicly that he was, get, he was realizing his sinful condition more and more. Paul didn't continue on in the ministry, and at the, by the end, and he's going, man, I, I pretty much don't sin anymore. At the end, he says, I am certain I am the chief of all sinners. That's what Paul ends with. That, that's the progression of a walk with the Lord. We realize it's God's grace, and worship should demonstrate the same thing. Now let's move on, verse 20. He says here, then Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron. We, we, we don't find out Miriam, Moses' older sister, was a prophetess apart from here. The sister of Aaron took the timbrel in her hand. So Miriam now hears the song of Moses. And we don't know exactly what she's saying if she kept singing through this. But she starts banging this timbrel in her hand. And all the women, it says, went out after her with timbrels and with dancers. You know, this is a lot of women here. You know, we believe, scholars tell us, was there a 600... A uh, thousand fighting men, the Bible tells us, between 20 and 50, plus women and children. So are there at least 600,000 women? Probably more. That's a lot of worship. Imagine dancing around, singing, the women worshiping the Lord. You know, it's incredible. This woman, Miriam, just begins to sing to the Lord. Verse 21, and Miriam answered them, sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. Now listen, Miriam's not going to do this thing perfectly. You know, in a few chapters, we're going to see Miriam. She's going to get leprosy. She's not going to be too happy with her younger brother. He's going to go from Moses, the deliverer, to Moses, my little midget brother. And God is going to handle things for Moses. But Miriam here has an interesting life, you know. At this point, you know, sometimes we miss this. You know, Miriam here at this point, this is Moses' older sister. She's over at this point, 90 years old at this time. You know, older folks love you. 
Love you. But I'm telling you, Miriam at 90 years old says, give me the timbrel. You know, <laughs> it's powerful. Think about it. Moses wasn't that much younger than her while he's walking across the Red Sea. You know, we miss these, these truths. You know, and this woman has had a strange life. You think at the age of 9 or 10 approximately, uh, that is when all the children were being killed in Egypt. This is when all the children of the Jews were being thrown into the Nile River, being killed. And she's there. She's got her little brother, Moses. She's watching this play out. It's not her job. She doesn't know what is going to happen. She watches her mom and dad have some guts and say, we're not doing it. We're not doing it. She saw her mother put the little brother in, in the bulrushes. That's Moses. She follows Moses as he floats down. Pharaoh's daughter picks him up. She's got the guts at 9 or 10 to say, hey, do you want me to go get a Hebrew woman to be the, mid, to, to be the nursemaid? You know? And she runs to her mom, 9 or 10. Mom, Pharaoh's daughter got, got a little baby Mo, you know? <laughs> uh, we don't know what his name really was because the Pharaoh's daughter tells it. When we get to heaven, we're going to say, where's Moses? They're going to say, there's no Moses, but there's Moishi over there or something, you know? But, I mean, you just think about this. She goes and gets him. You know, you got to imagine at this point, you know, Miriam's pretty proud of Moses, her brother. You know, but it took her about 90 years to get it. 90 years old, and she finally gets to give me the tambourine. Let's worship. Took her 90 years. Listen, you'll get it eventually. Don't worry. You'll get it. You go, when am I going to get it? I don't know. You'll get it. Just stay the course. <laughs> she gets it. Watch this, verse 22. We're going to read to the end. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, so they are just excited. This is a few days later now, between verse 21 and 22. A few days, just a couple days. They just saw the Egyptians slaughtered by God. The Red Sea parted. Their worst, I mean, this is probably one of the largest worship services in the history of mankind, two to three million, worshiping the Lord. I mean, imagine how they sang. I got a feeling they weren't like, I will sing unto the Lord. You know, they are shouting. This is a war cry. The nations around them are hearing the ground shake. They're worshiping the Lord. So Moses, a few days later, brings Israel from the Red Sea because you can't just stay at the victory. You got to keep moving forward, right? Then they went out into the wilderness of Shur. So they were very sure of the direction they were heading in. And they went three days in the wilderness. So you think the first day in the wilderness, they're still whistling, you know. You know, man, you remember that song? Wow, they're praising God. Still high-fiving, right? Still high-fiving. Wow, God is good. The second day, they're going, man, where is this Moses guy? He's good, though, right? Moses, all right? You like Moses? I like him. He's good. Okay. Where's he taking us? Not sure. Well, let's follow him, you know? Let's keep going. By the third day, well, three days in, <laughs> it says, and they found no water there in verse 22. Now they're like, all right, where's this Moses fellow? We need to have a meeting, you know? They go, I don't know. What's his credentials again? I don't think he went to seminary. I don't know, you know. That Egyptian rigmarole. We wouldn't have done this as in our Hebrew culture. He was raised Egyptian. You don't know how we do it here. You know, three days in, they go from, from worshiping to worrying. Boy, happened so fast. Verse 23. Now, when they came to Mara, so now they come to a water. There's, a, there's water they haven't drank. It's very hot. It is. It is the desert. They come to Mara. It says they could not drink the waters of Mara for they were bitter. So just picture this. They're now very thirsty. They go from the highest high. Now they quickly, you know, we fluctuate quickly. You know, we go to the lowest low. And now we're like, where's the water? We see the water. Oh, that's going to do it. That's it. That's what I've been looking for. That's what I need. And if I get there, I'll be thirsty. I'll quench my thirst. They run, right? You just picture two to three million stampeding through this wilderness, right? Moses, what an idiot. But I got water. I'll find it myself. They jump in the water. They start drinking. <laughs> Why? Bitter. Bitter waters. Therefore, the name of it was called Mara. Verse 24, and the people complained against Moses saying, what shall we drink? You can almost hear him. You know, Moses... Moses, if you're taking notice, number three, worship is our worship. Number three is we follow after Jesus his way. It's a very important. It's a very important point here. Very important, guys. You know, this is very common, and, and I want to make this very clear to you. The, as, we, as the children of Israel will go through the Red Sea, now they will move on, there will be plots and, and points on this journey that I want to tell you are what every single Christian has to go through. 
You know, if you remember back when you went to school, you had electives and you had the prerequisites, right? So no matter how many times you wanted to take basket weaving 101, you know, you couldn't just, uh, well, I, I should graduate. I, I took typing. Okay, it's, it's prereq, right? And I love, my favorite class wasn't even close. I love Jim, love Jim. It was great. Jim, somebody said, what's your second favorite? Lunch. That was my second favorite was lunch. <laughs> you know? And my third favorite was called skip class. It was called the skip class class. It was a great class to go to. But um, anyways, but you realize, you know, you got to take classes. These are not, pre these are prereqs. You cannot, you can't get past this. This is Mara 101. You will have to pass Mara 101. And what is Mara 101? What is this class? This is it. Is God saves you. And then you go through a trial, and as you go through a trial, you say in your head, if I can just get to Mara, sometimes that is actually her name, if I could just get to Mara, then I'll be satisfied. <laughs> That's it. Sometimes his name is Mark. You know? Sometimes it's Jabba, right? Or it's Hausa, or it's, you know, it's a, a part of the country, uh, you know. If I could just get back then, I'll be happy. I've had these friends. You know, if, if I could get to know Pastor Bill better, I'll be happy. No, you won't. You won't like me. <laughs> Trust me. You're going to be like, why did I come here? It's not great. And you're like, this guy's kind of mean, actually. You know, it's like, it's called Mara. <laughs> it's Mara. It's Mara. It's not true. You have to get past this. God had to do this with the children of Israel. They had to go through this. You know, there are some Christians been going, I mean, they've repeated Mara like a thousand times. You know, they're that kid. You know, you're like in fourth grade and they have a goatee. You're like, <laughs> you know, I think you should have graduated by now from college, you know. But sometimes the Lord is good like this. You know, this is where people mistake God. They're like, but he's so nice. He's so kind. He's slow to anger. Yeah, and he says, repeat. And we do it again. And we, you know, we, fall, we run tomorrow. Drink, bitter, again, Lord, you're supposed to change the waters. He's going, no, that's not what I'm looking for. Bat, nah. Groundhog Day. You ever seen that movie? Groundhog Day. It's like, ah, not again, right? And it is what it is. God's like, got to learn this one again. You see, they, for, they didn't realize something. This is a very important point to make. This is, this is something that the church in America today, very few Christians understand this. Folks, Moses wasn't the leader of the children of Israel. It's not accurate. He was their leader, but he wasn't the leader. It's not true. The reason why the children of Israel went to the Red Sea between Migdal and Pihahiroth, between a rock and a hard place with the Red Sea at their back. The reason why after they crossed through and they went to Mara was because that is where the pillar by fire by night and the cloud by day went. You see, Moses was their physical representation to keep them on guard, right? To keep them going in the right direction. But Moses didn't go to Mara because he says, you know, I've always kind of wanted to check out Mara. You know, it's kind of on the bucket list type of thing. He went there because the pillar of fire at night and the pillar of cloud by day went there. That's why they went. You know, you come to, you come to the church today. Well, Ephesians 4 tells us God gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastor teachers for the equipping of the saints for the working of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, that we all come to the fullness. Listen, just so you guys know, I didn't pick this for my life. I wasn't a little kid growing up and going, oh, man, one day. Just can't wait to be a pastor and tell people what to do. I just can't wait. Never. I never, never one second of my life was like, ah. I mean, I wanted to be a dirt bike racer. It was a long time. You know, then I rode a dirt bike, and I said, nah, I don't think so. You know, <laughs> I want to be an athlete, put, spend a lot of time, and be, you know, into sports. You know, then I thought I could, you know, do some other things and, you know, make a lot of money. And then the Lord saved me, and then he called me. That's it. But, folks, you know, whether you know it here at Calvary Chapel, you know, it's not like, well, you know, the reason, the reason why we're in Newport, we have this plan, we have this 12-point plan to reach all of this region for Jesus. No, that's not why. It's not true. It's not accurate, guys. It's like, well, then how, why are we there? The Lord. It's the Lord. Why, why am I here? Because the Lord. Because the Lord. And why are we reading the Bible and studying it on a Wednesday? Because the Lord. The Lord told us to do this. We're trying to follow him. And one thing the Lord is going to do is he's going to uh, uh, heal us from that concept 
to see some springs and believe if I can only get that job, I'll be refreshed. If I can only get married, you know, then I'll be happy. Just ask the married folk, you know. If I can only get that raise, I can only move to that place, then I'll be refreshed. Look, it looks so promising, but when we get there, we find out it's bitter. You know, and that's immediately when man starts to doubt God. And that's when we see the children of Israel begin to doubt God. And watch this. There is a purpose here. You go, is there any hope for this then? How are we going to make it? Watch this, verse 25. So Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. Underline this. Don't miss this, guys. This is big in the Bible. When he cast the tree into the waters, the waters were made sweet. And there he made a statute and an ordinance for them. And there he tested them, verse 26, and said, If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you, which I have brought on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. And this is where we get the name of God, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer. God says, I will heal you. Then they came to Elam where there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees. So they camped there by the waters. And we'll see next week this next prereq course there in Elam. But tonight, as we close, number four, if you're taking note, worship is our worship. And as we worship, as we go, Lord, I want to pass Mara 101. You know, <laughs> I want to pass. Even if it's just with a D minus, Lord, I'm okay. I'm okay. Just want to pass. Number four is you need to throw in the tree. You got to throw in the tree. What does this do? What is this? The tree in the Bible is the cross, folks. It's the cross. Galatians 3, verse 13, you could jot it down. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23 through 24, both Paul, Peter, all through the New Testament and Galatians, Paul says, cursed is the man who hangs on a tree. The tree is that old tree right outside Jerusalem where Jesus was crucified, where all our sins were paid for on the cross, past, present, and future. And this is the secret to bitterness. This is it. You know, if you're struggling with forgiving somebody or you're struggling with forgiving God, which can happen, you have to go back to the tree. You got to remember what he's done for you and what he's done for me, that he died for all of your sins. And he died for the sins of the world. The person that has wronged you and wronged me, Jesus Christ on the cross, died for their sins. You say, but it's not fair. He hasn't, justice hasn't been done or this hasn't happened. Listen, that day will come if that person chooses to reject what Jesus did for them on the cross. But today, those Mara waters in our hearts, those ideas of, man, if I can just get this, then I'll be happy. We deal with those by throwing in the tree. Jesus Christ gained his life by losing it. Jesus Christ gained our life by losing it, right? Amen? It's the cross. It's not true. It's not true. You know, the more we do me, it doesn't make me happier. <laughs> it's not true. He who seeks to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, man, you'll find it. And how do you deal with whatever bitter experience we, we may have had in life? It's the cross. It's understanding what happened at that cross. It's appropriating it to our own lives and watching the bitter waters in our lives be made sweet. And I want to tell you something. If you get saved, you come to know Christ. And then you begin to live for the Lord. You read your Bible, you pray, you come to church. But then you go back to some of those old things. The waters will get bitter again. They will. They'll get bitter again. There's pain. You know, God forgives the sin. He does not forgive the consequence, guys. You know, it, it, Jesus, when he was tempted by Satan in the wilderness, Satan says, he says, you could, he brought him to the top of the temple. And he says, throw yourself down from here. God has said he will command his angels to catch you. What did Jesus say? You're not to test the Lord your God. You know, if Jesus would have jumped from that thing, hey, no, the angel ain't catching him. You had a Jesus pancake on the floor, you know? It's consequences. Listen, you got to throw the cross in. The cross of Jesus, what he did for us, it's powerful. It's powerful. And, and because of that, we could worship him. You know, some of us, maybe we're not worshiping because, you know, we sense, oh, you know, the Lord has left me or he didn't meet this need or, you know, uh, uh, maybe, you're, maybe you've been at the Mara for a long time. And you're going, I don't know how to pass this course. I tried. You know, I looked at the person's paper next to me. I even copied. I got it wrong, you know. 
I can't figure out how to get past this course. Listen, the way to get past this course, you have to throw the cross in. You got to throw the cross in. You know, there's a reason why, you know, Paul said, you know, I've determined to preach nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Because the cross is powerful. Paul says in Romans that the gospel is the power of God and it's a salvation for those who believe. This isn't just getting your Christian sticker and put it on your chest. This is, this is salvation. It's sozo. It's actually being rescued from the cold, stormy waves of life where you are drowning and actually being set. Your feet are set on a rock. But there's just this step of faith. There's this moment where you have to let go. Where it's like, well, you know, I was hurt by this person. I, this was happening. I'm disappointed about this. And I'm just hanging on to it. Because if I let go of it, if I let go of it, maybe it'll never happen. <laughs> maybe I'll never get healed from this. Maybe I'll get hurt again. Maybe somebody else will hurt me. I'm telling you right now, the only way to get healed of it is to let go of it to the Lord. It's the only way. Say, Lord, I believe that on that cross, that person or that situation... Lord, I'm, you know, saying, Lord, I'm sorry for doing, being disappointed with you, God, when you demonstrated your love for me by laying your life down. And I'm just so grateful. And, you know, maybe you need to pray tonight and say, Lord, help me to be content. Help me to be content in just knowing you. Just knowing you. Just realizing, you know, I was leaving this conference over in Oregon. And, you know, the guys, we had a good time that week, a couple days. And, you know, this God moved in power. There's some real things happening. And, you know, a couple of the guys were like, man, you know, I hope you come back to Oregon. I said, listen, it was so good to be with you. I'll never be back here again, you know. I can guarantee that. You know, I was like, I was like, my Lord, have mercy on you people out here, you know. I mean, you think it's bad. In, I mean, it is, we, we might as well live in, uh, you know, George Washington's land or something here. But, but you know, I said to him, I said, well, I'll do that. I says, man, I will see you in heaven. That's for sure. We're going to spend eternity together. I said, just come over to the New York section where no homeless people live on our yards. You know what I mean? I said, you're going to love it. It's great. I said, it's a little direct, and you're going to think we're mean. But it's all done because we love you. But, uh, you know, the Lord loves us too. He loves us. Be free from bitterness. Amen? Amen. All right, let's stand. We're going to close out. In a, I'll just, uh, let's sing a song a cappella, then I'll pray for us. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. And I lift. And I lift my voice to worship, to worship you, O oh, my soul. Rejoice, take joy, take joy, my King. In what you hear, and let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. And Father, I pray that you would bless your people. Bless them with the gift to be able to worship you, Lord. Father, call them to yourself and let them know worship, it's not just a song, it's a lifestyle, it's a life, it's, a, it's worshiping you, it's, it's Lord, um, the Greek word proskuneo, it's a dog licking its master's hand, Lord. We never get home and our dog looks at us and goes, eh, <laughs> you're not that great. God, we just pray that we would worship you, that we'd worship you and we'd worship you alone, Lord. And that God, I even pray tonight, if there's any other worship in our lives, Lord, anything else that we bow before, as the old song says, Lord, we don't lift our soul to any other. Lord, if we've been lifting our soul to any other, Lord, we pray tonight to forgive us. Forgive us, Lord. We just confess our sin. Lord, we just say the same thing as your word says. Lord, that it's foolishness, us worshiping man-made objects or Lord, things that Satan has created to, to, to bait us into, to rebel against the God who loves us. And God, we ask you to forgive us. And Lord, we just want to worship you. We pray that we would worship you and that we would realize worship. Lord, yes, it is a song, and it is a song, but it's also the song of our heart, Lord. That we would just grow closer to you, that you'd bless your people, and that, Father, if, uh, and I mean this, Lord, if before we gather together again, Lord, on Sunday, 
uh, the youth on Friday. If before we gather again, Lord, we hear the trump of God and the dead in Christ rise, and we who remain are caught up to meet you in the air. Lord, I pray that we would be ready to worship, Lord. I pray we'd be ready to worship because we're going to. We're going to worship the Lamb. We're going to throw our crowns at your feet. We're going to see the nail wounds and your wrists and your feet and know for all eternity why we're there. Not by our good works, but by your grace and your love. So, Father, bless your people as they go and give them a song, Lord, in their hearts. In, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.